In this lecture, we are going to finally implement our Q-Learning Trader. Since this script will use the same data as our machine learning script, we'll have to download the full S&P dataset. Next, we import pandas, numpy, matplotlib, and iter tools. You'll see how we make use of iter tools shortly. Next, we load in our data frame using pd.readcsv. Since you've already seen how we process this data frame, we'll go through this more quickly. So first, we drop any rows that have all missing values, since these rows are irrelevant. Next, we drop any columns with at least one missing value, since we don't want to bother with forward filling or back filling. Next, we generate a new data frame containing all log returns for each of the S&P components. Next, we split the data into train and test using the returns data frame. Next, we specify that our input features will be Apple, Microsoft, and Amazon. By the way, it's worth noting that, because we are using binning, the state space will grow exponentially. If each column has 10 bins and we have 3 columns, then there are 10 times 10 times 10 unique bins in total. If we have D features, then we would have 10 to the power D bins. This is exactly exponential growth, and so, using this method, the time and space requirements of your program will grow quite fast. Next, we have the ENV class. This is mostly the same as it was before, so we'll go through this quickly. The main difference is that, inside the constructor, the rewards are now the SPY column of the data frame. The features are also different, but the code is still the same since our features are specified by a variable called feats. Next we have the state mapper class. This is probably the most complex piece of code in the script. It relies heavily on the theory lecture that came before. So I'll mention again that, if you don't quite get this, then you'll want to go back to the theory lecture to make sure you understand everything we discussed. So the purpose of this object is to transform a given continuous vector of states to the correct bins. The constructor is responsible for defining the bin boundaries. It takes in an ENV object and bins, specifying the number of bin boundaries and end samples. The basic idea for the constructor is this. As you know, we want to have a bunch of sample values for each of the state variables so that we can estimate their frequency. In order to collect these samples, we're going to run through the environment many times, performing only random actions. After we've collected these samples, we can sort them and define the boundaries as we described previously. So first, I'm going to create an empty list called states. This is where we will store the states that we collect. Next, we set done to false, and we call env.reset. Next, we set an instance variable d to be the length of the state vector. This will be the number of sets of bins that we need to create. Next, we append the initial state to our list of states. Next, we enter a loop that iterates n samples times. Inside the loop, we choose a random action from the environment's action space by calling np.random.choice. Next, we call env.step, passing in our random action. This gives us the next state, S2, which we also append to our list of states. Next, we check whether or not we are done. If we are, then we reset the environment and start again. Next, now that we've finished collecting states, we cast it to a NumPy array for easy indexing by row and column. Next, we need to create the bin boundaries for each column of data. So we start by creating an instance variable called self.bins. This will be an empty list, and we'll update this with the bin boundaries for each dimension. Next, we loop through each of the D dimensions. Inside the loop, we sort the Dth column of our states array. We'll call this variable column. Next, we want to find the boundaries for this column of samples. So we start by initializing an empty list called current bin. This will store all the boundaries. 
Next, we do a loop, n bins times. Note that this is a bit of an inaccurate name. It's not actually the number of bins, but rather the number of bin boundaries. Inside the loop, we find the boundary by taking n samples, dividing it by n bins, and multiplying it by k plus 0.5. This ensures that we center the bin boundaries, as discussed in the theory lecture. You might want to plug in some numbers to make sure that this roughly makes sense. For example, let's suppose we use the numbers from the theory lecture. So we have 100 samples and 10 bins. If k equals 0, then we get 100 divided by 10, which is 10. We multiply 10 by 0 0.5, which gives us 5. So our first boundary is 5, which is correct. Our second boundary is 10 times 1.5, which is 15, which is correct. Our last boundary is 10 times 9.5, which is 95, which is correct. Okay, so at the end of this loop, we'll have all the boundaries stored in the list, current bin. Then we simply append the current bin to self.bins. Next, we have the transform function. This is the function we call when we want to convert a continuous state vector into the corresponding bin tuple. Okay, so this function takes in one argument, which is the continuous state. Next, we create an array of zeros of length d called x. This is where we will store the bin values. Next, we loop through each of the d dimensions. Inside the loop, we call np.digitize on the dth state value using the dth bin boundaries. We assign this to x at location d. Finally, we cast x to a tuple and return it. Next, we have a function called all possible states. It may not be clear why we need this yet, but recall that when we create our queue table, it is updated iteratively. That is, the new value always depends on the old value. Therefore, each input to queue must have some initial value. Therefore, we must provide an initial value for all the states. And therefore, we need to know what all the states are. Okay, so to do this, basically the secret sauce is to use the iterTools.products function. You're encouraged to do some simple examples on your own, so you can understand how this works. Basically, we need to create a list. Each element of this list must itself be a list. Each of these lists should contain all the possible bins for that dimension. As you recall, these count up from 0 to 1 plus the number of bin boundaries. So the code here is a bit verbose, but if you look at it carefully, it should make sense. The number of bins is the length of the bins list, and then we add 1. We call the range function to go from 0 up to that number. Then we cast it to a list to convert it to a list. Finally, we call iterTools.product to get all the possible combinations of the elements of these lists. As mentioned previously, the best way to understand this is to simply try a few examples in your console. Okay, so next, we have the agent class. This is yet another chunky bit of code. As you can imagine, this will be quite a bit more complicated than our trend-following agent, which doesn't learn at all. Okay, so first, we have the constructor. This takes in two arguments, the action size and the state mapper object. We start by assigning a bunch of instance variables. So these are action size, discount factor gamma, epsilon, learning rate, and state mapper. You already know what all these things are, so I won't explain them. Our next job is to initialize the queue table. As mentioned previously, the queue table is updated iteratively, and therefore, each of the values must start somewhere. We'll start by initializing Q to an empty dictionary. Next, we loop through all possible states by calling statemapper.allPossibleStates. Inside this loop, we cast the state S to a tuple. This is because iterTools returns a list, but lists are not immutable. Next, we loop through each action as well. This is because Q is indexed by state and action, so we need all possible combinations of these. Okay, and next, 
We assign the Q value for this state and this action to be a random number drawn from the standard normal. All right, so that's the constructor. Next, we have the act function. This is still just epsilon greedy, but a little more complicated since we need to search our Q table. So first, we generate a random number between a zero and one. If this random number is less than epsilon, we return a random action. Otherwise, we continue. We then use our state mapper, and we call the transform function to convert the state into its bin representation. Next, we look at our Q table for this state and all possible actions. We'll put this into a list called act values. Next, we take the argmax of act values to return the optimal action for this state. Next, we have the train function. The goal of this function is to implement the Q-learning formula that you learned about earlier. Inside this function, we first transform state and next state to their bin representation. We'll call these S and S2. Next, we check whether or not S2 is a terminal state by looking at the done flag. If it is, then the target is equal to the reward. Otherwise, we grab all the possible Q values for the next state S2 over all possible actions. We'll call this act values. Next, we create our TD target, which is the reward plus gamma times the max over act values. Finally, we apply our Q learning formula to update Q for the given state and the given action. Next, we have the play one episode function. This is mostly the same as earlier, except now we have one extra argument called is train. As expected, our model will train only on the train set, but not on the test set. So again, this is basically the same as before. The only extra line is inside the loop where we check is train. If is train is true, then we call agent.train, which hopefully makes sense. All right, so next, all that's left to do is make use of everything we just created. So let's start by setting num episodes to 500. This is the number of episodes that will be used to train our agent. Next, we create two environments, one for train and one for test. Next, we set the action size to the length of the action space. We also instantiate the state mapper and the agent. Next, we create two empty arrays to store the total reward we receive from each episode for both train and test. Next, we do a loop, num episodes times. Inside the loop, we first play one episode with the train environment. We set is train to true since we want our agent to learn during this process. We get back the reward R and we assign this to our train rewards array. Next, we run our agent on the test set. Before we do this, we're going to set epsilon to zero so that our agent does not explore during testing. We start by saving the current epsilon in a variable called temp epsilon. Next, we set agent.epsilon to zero. Next, we play one episode with the test set, setting is trained to false. After that's complete, we reassign a temp epsilon to agent.epsilon. Finally, we save the reward to our test rewards array. At the end of this loop, we print out the episode number and the reward for both train and test. Okay, so let's run this. Okay, so the last step is to plot both the train and test rewards. Okay, so as you can see, our model does pretty well. Obviously, it does much better on the train set since that's what our agent learned on. Note that since there is some randomness in this algorithm, you're going to get a different result each time you run this.
However, you'll notice that pretty much every time, Q-learning beats buy and hold on the test set. You'll also notice that as the agent learns, the variability in the test rewards seems to go down. This is a good thing because we can be more certain that good performance is due to doing something intelligent rather than random luck.